Thank you, Sam. And let me also welcome the folks to uh, the program, as, as Sam said, titled Safe Deposit, The Do's and Don'ts. And as that name would imp- imply, today's program is going to be the nitty-gritty, nuts and bolts, day-to-day operation that hopefully you're following to keep you out of trouble. When I say trouble, we've, we've got a se- uh, segment of this program today that's going to talk about some institutions that weren't following these procedures, and because of that, they get, got in lots of trouble. But before we do that, let me just quickly mention, uh, I do these programs all around the United States, and the handout material that you have uh, provided to you for today's session, it's extremely important, as Sam said, to have a copy with every person that's listening to today's program. That's important because today's program is very interactive, and you'll be taking notes from the time I start talking to the time we stop. And the second thing I'd like to mention is in your group, if you have more than one person, what I'd like you to do now is select the person who is the most familiar with your current safe deposit procedures. That's critical because that is typically the person that has the most questions, and as we said, we have a couple of Q&A sessions today, and we want that person, we want all of you to submit the questions as we go along. So we uh, we make sure we, we try to address as many of those as we can today. Now, the last thing I'd like to mention to you is what you see on, I believe that's page uh, two in your handout. I've been doing this for a long time. 45 years is how, I, how long I've been talking about safe deposit. And I got started talking about this many, many years ago when I was a banker here in Houston, Texas. And as a banker, where I was for 20 years, uh, I got involved in the safe deposit area, much like how many of our listeners got involved when I inherited this department at my last bank. Somebody just walked up one day and said, Dave, you're in charge of safe deposit now. And, folks, I didn't have a clue what those people did in that department. All I knew about that department was I had a lady sitting at a desk right outside of a vault, and inside that vault we had 3,000 safe deposit boxes. I also knew that lady had some keys in her desk, and those people that had the boxes rented in there had some keys in their pocket, and together, after they signed something, they went in that vault and got their stuff out of their box. Vast knowledge. Well, thinking there might be a few other things involved in this department, I went to a, uh, attended a seminar similar to the one you're sitting in today, talking about correct procedures and things that we need to be doing, and found out that everything we were doing in that department was absolutely wrong so wrong that we could be sued on a daily basis, and not a person in our bank knew that. So today's program will, again, kind of recap what I learned 45 years ago, but more importantly, it's going to talk about what I'm seeing being done wrong throughout the United States. And these are lawsuits, these are claims, these are disappearance uh, situations that are occurring because good procedures are not followed correctly. So right now, let's just do a little quick recap of what today's program is going to consist of. First of all, the, the first section in your handout, we're going to talk about some liability issues that each of you assume when you rent one safe deposit box to one person. I don't care whether you have one box rented or 3,000 boxes rented, all of us have the same liability when we offer this service, and that liability is unknown. And when I say unknown, we're also going to talk about some lawsuits that have occurred throughout the United States that these institutions had to write big checks. And in that segment, we have five historical-type lawsuits that uh, uh, big checks were written. You'll see how much when we get there. But uh, more importantly, they range from $100,000 up to $30 million. And, folks, that's not the type of check you want to be writing when somebody says something's gone out of their box. We also have some current lawsuits that have just occurred within the last 12 months, and I want to kind of recap what each one of these institutions did because many of them are scheduled to go to trial within the next two or three months into 2014, and once they go to trial, all the things we're going to talk about today will be brought up, will be questioned, and if they don't have good procedures in place to defend against these, these or basically justify what they're doing, these things can be used against them. And the second area we're going to talk about is how do you rent a safe deposit box properly, what kind of identification do we need, what kind of forms have to be filled out, what kind of supplies have to be given to these new renters. All of that will be covered in the second section. Then, as easy as you think it is, how do you close the safe deposit box? We have an entire section in your handout on the step-by-step procedures that have to be followed, and if you skip over any of those, the people can come back and sue you. And the longest section in your handout is number four, how do you let people in and out of their boxes? 
box access is the area that you're going to be asked the most questions about sitting on that witness stand under oath in front of 12 people in a jury box. And if you can't address these box access questions correctly with good procedures in place, have your checkbook ready because you're going to lose these cases. And then the final section, we're going to talk about the controls of all the keys that you're responsible for in the safe deposit area. Key control. And this would be your guard keys, your half of the dual control key system. These would be keys to unrented safe deposit boxes. These would be keys that are mailed to you. These would be keys that are dropped in your night deposit. These are keys that somebody drives through your uh, drive-in window and sends a key in uh, by your pneumatic tube, and they drive off. There are procedures in place to handle every one of those situations, and if you don't handle them properly, you're going to lose any kind of litigation. So, again, as you can see, we have lots and lots of information to cover, and we've got two hours to do it. So now let's go to get started in the, uh, the, the first section in your handout, which talks about safe deposit lawsuits. And as you see on that page, we have five lawsuits, all of which were significant lawsuits, significant lawsuits. And the first one, I want you to write down the, uh, the missing procedures. Uh, the first lawsuit that we're going to talk about is $4 million. That's what this lawsuit cost this institution. And the reason they uh, lost is the thing you're going to write down now. They had box numbers stamped on all their safe deposit renters' box keys. Box numbers stamped on safe deposit keys cost this bank $4 million. Now, if you have numbers stamped on your safe deposit keys right now that you're giving out to all your box renters, listen carefully to what happened to this institution and see if you think this could happen to you. This story starts early one morning when a lady walks into the safe deposit area and goes to the attendant and says, I need to get in my jointly rented box that my husband, my husband and I have rented in that vault. They pull the uh, entry card. They get the lady to sign. The, the, the lady goes over and verifies the signature. That everything is fine. And then they take the lady back in the vault. Once inside the vault, that lady reached into her purse, pulled out a key, and handed it to the safe deposit employee. The employee read the number off that key and left that lady in that box. That lady cleaned out that box and left the vault. At 12 o'clock that same day, that lady's husband was served with divorce papers. The first place she went was First place he went was to the same bank, the same vault, to get into his individually rented safe deposit box that the wife had stolen a key to, had gone in and cleaned out everything in that box. Stocks, bonds, securities, cash, you name it. Well, the man started screaming he wanted all of his stuff back, and the second mistake the bank made on that same day is when they told that gentleman, you need to prove you had all that stuff in that box, or we're not even going to talk to you about this. They know they've done something wrong, but they're going to harass the man a little bit. Well, that made him mad. He walked out of that bank, went right to his attorney's office, and told the attorney, I want you to sue that bank. I want you to prove to them that I could have had all these things in my box, which was easy for them to do because this guy's a multimillionaire, folks. And his accountant was drawn in on this and proved that this guy could have had all those things in there. But after they listed all these things, he also told his attorney, Go ahead and add uh, this, 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 and this to that lawsuit, because I'm going to say those were in the box, too, which he did. And that lawsuit was filed against the institution, and it went back and forth between the bank's attorneys and his attorney for two long years. Two years later, when the bank finally woke up to the fact that if we have to go into a courtroom and they were scheduled for a trial, and we have to admit we let the wrong person clean out this guy's box, we're going to lose this case. When that finally dawned on them and they decided to settle this case out of court, when they stopped writing checks to the man, his attorney, his CPA that proved he could have had all that stuff in there, and to the bank's attorneys, those checks totaled to over $4 million, folks. Again, a very expensive mistake. So we go back to incorrect procedures, having numbers on keys. is, is it, They're out there now. I know a lot of institutions have them. So what I'm trying to tell folks in all my seminars is forget the number is there. You may have it on the keys. Some of you don't have any numbers, and that's kind of the national trend right now. Banks are getting rid of those numbers. But if you, if you do have numbers, train your people to forget the number is there and only go by what the legal document has on it. When you verify that signature against a legal document, the contract is in there.